Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt, Connor, and Max talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. You know, last episode we talked about the atomic bomb. Uh, we talked mainly about the Pacific, but one thing that is often brought up is the fact that the atomic bomb could have been used in Europe. So let's uh, let's kind of delve into that a bit. Uh, well, uh, the the bomb would have been used probably in the spring of '45 because at that point it was clear that you know Germany was collapsing in on itself and defeat was pretty imminent. But for for purposes of this situation, let's say it's November of 1944. So earlier on, and I'd read somewhere a couple years ago that actually there was some production delay problems with processing uranium. So a bomb could have been ready as early as this point. Hmm. And so we're projecting, let's say that, that a bomb is ready in November 44 and we figure the allies were going to use it. So just to contextualize, this is before the Battle of the Bulge. Yes. Where are, where are the allied troops and where are the Russian troops at this point? So we've got the Western allies are on the Western Wall and have breached at certain points. The Patton is in the Saar land. The area around Aachen, is, which is in Germany, the allies have, are fighting for the city at this point near the Hurtgen Forest. Um, the Soviets are on the Vistula, though, near Warsaw. So they haven't really, they've entered East Prussia, but they haven't really invaded Eastern Germany yet. So Germany as a whole is still pretty much in, under Nazi control. Hmm. So at this point, I think if the Allies are going to use the nuclear bomb against Germany, we're probably looking at Berlin yeah. as the primary target. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's going to be an event that is certainly going to go down history because if an atomic bomb is dropped on Berlin in 1944, um, well, there's a lot of stuff in Berlin. We're looking at the Reichstag. <laughs> yes. Uh, many of the members of the Nazi high command. I mean, this is Adolf, Adolf possibly Hitler. Possibly Hitler. Yeah. Goering. Unless he's out of town at the time. Right. Himmler will be there. Mm -hmm. Goebbels will be there. And so, <laughs> assuming, there, assuming that there's no type of warning, we're looking at the eradication of pretty much the entire Nazi party leadership in yeah, one fell swoop. Yeah, this is a pretty much a decapitating strike. Um, I think that this is really going to, depending on where they drop it. I mean, obviously the ad, you know, we're, let's assume it's little boy that they're dropping. Like clearly not as powerful as a current uh, atomic weapon, but going to do a lot of damage. And if it does kill most of the hierarchy, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Like who's going to take control? Because if like if Hitler, Himmler, Goering, and Goebbels are dead, I guess it falls on the army. Yeah, well, you've got to assume that the army will try and reassert their uh, their control. And also keep in mind that Nazi Germany is not monolithic. I mean, there's many different factions working inside of it. And, you know, you could maybe even see like some kind of small civil war breaking out. Maybe not like actually fighting one another, but among the leadership. Yeah, or a major and, power struggle. Well, yeah, yeah. well, the army and the SS. I could see a, you know, sort of tension erupting there. Like right, a Night of the Long Knives thing happening right in the middle of this apocalyptic war. That's oh, going on except the shoe might be on the other foot because we might be, I mean, the SS would probably be reeling after having lost most of the hardcore, not, you know, the really hardcore Nazis at the top, the SS would, might be in a worse uh, situation as opposed to a more traditional power base for the army, maybe slightly more moderate um, well, uh, approach. I don't know. I, I feel like in a situation like this, like the probably the army is going to take control. And I would guess probably seek negotiations because at this point... Right. You know, I'm sure the Allies would threaten, like, if you don't surrender, like, we got another one of these ready. Because that's what they did with, with Hiroshima. They dropped the bomb and they mm -hmm. said, you should surrender now. And the Japanese still refused to surrender, so they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. I'm assuming, you know, the Allies are going to be like, well, some, there's, somewhere else will be next. We'll be, whether it be Hamburg, Dresden, Frankfurt, Munich, Nuremberg. Maybe Nuremberg, because that was like the sort of like symbolic, symbolic heart right. of, of sort of, of Nazism. But... It'd be interesting. I, I feel like quickly the, the the German army would probably say we need to we can't hold up against this. I mean, could they even continue to fight after losing all that stuff? It's well, hard. I mean, you talk about Nuremberg being the symbolic kind of the heart of Germany, but if Berlin were wiped off the face of the earth hmm. in a single day, that's pretty much the equivalent of tearing the heart out of the country. Well, the army will still be intact because you've still got you know the troops getting ready for the Battle of the Bulge in the West, but. 
overall, I think it's going to really take the wind out of the sails of what's left in Germany because if all that high command is gone and you've got the troops... I mean, what general might you what might, might, might we see? Well, Rommel's dead by November of 44. Right. Uh, maybe Gerd von Runestead if he's still kicking around or mm. Manstein. Depends on who's in, who's not, who, if there's... if. You know, if someone like Manstein or is not in Berlin at the time, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but who knows? Like, it's a it's a big question. Um, I would feel like the Allies would probably try and target a time where they knew they were in Berlin, so they could make this a decapitating strike. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who knows? Like, it, it it's hard to say. Maybe some other politician we don't know, regional politician steps up if there's a real vacuum. Not really sure. It's hard to maybe. say. I mean, you with with German troops in the east and in the west, we have to you know. We might be looking at the commander of one of those two yeah. uh, ar armies. Well, what kind of surrender do you think they'd be looking for? Like a like a classic unconditional surrender, like yeah. Japan, or I'm figuring an unconditional surrender. And I'm and in that situation, I think the German army people in the army may say like, "Well, we got the Russians po." Po they're they're poised on the Vistula. They're probably going to attack in the mm -hmm. early part of next year. And there's like, not going to be any mercy when they attack. Yes, and right. they're going to be right near Berlin or what was left of it at this point. But you know, <laughs> like poised to plunge right into Germany, and they probably say, "Well, we might as well take the best deal we can get, which is surrender now, mm -hmm. and instead of being destroyed and overrun by the Soviets." Which I guess makes sense because Hitler's not in charge. Like these hardliners who these never surrender exactly. types, right? And except for the part where we the killed ones who, ourselves, who would end up, yeah, surrender. the ones who would end up killing themselves. Yes. Because they didn't want to very have to. large number of them <laughs> yeah and their families as well yeah, yeah of course. Um, but it's it'll be yeah it'd be interesting to see so let's say they do do an unconditional surrender i'm sure the americans and the british are going to accept it the soviets aren't going to be happy but um it's really going to change the, the outlook of europe because i think germany's still going to get divided because i think that the, the russians are going to insist on that. occupation but, yeah mm -hmm. what do you guys think about that yeah i mean that makes a lot of sense i mean by splitting germany in half in real life it really did kind of put the stake in the heart of the whole movement itself uh, you weren't going to see a, another german revival like we did after world war one but obviously it probably wouldn't look the same way i mean would would communist russia get half of germany the way that they did in real life i mean they wouldn't we've got to think they're i mean the negotiating position for both sides is not going to be as strong just because neither side is really i mean okay russia's in eastern prussia a little bit but they really haven't even mm -hmm. rolled over poland yet yeah, yeah and then the allies going. the allies won't have reached berlin but i i think the allies might be in a better negotiating position considering that that their atomic bomb was the one that just ended the war. Exactly. And, I, agree, I agree totally with that. Yeah. And Berlin were, is not probably not going to be split in half. Because, because what is Berlin at this right, point? Right, because, you know... <laughs> it's going to be very heavily not, damaged. Not completely destroyed, mm -hmm. uh, but very heavily damaged. And it, yeah. it would just be fighting over scraps at that point, almost. Mm -hmm. Over, you know, who gets to oversee the reconstruction of the German capital. And I don't think Russia would fight quite as hard um, to, to, you know, get a stake in that. The, I think also a big question is, what is happening with the rest of Eastern Europe? Because yes. remember that there are large... The former Nazi holdings. Yeah, well, you've got parts of, like, large parts of Hungary, um, in Yugoslavia, in Austria, and the Czech Republic... Well, now it's now the Czech Republic, was then Czechoslovakia. Even mm -hmm. parts of Poland are still in German control. So are the, are the Western allies going to come off better from this? Are they going to have more of a say in these areas because the Soviets don't control them? So, I mean, I, it's interesting. This poses an interesting question. Well, I think that's the biggest yeah. difference mm -hmm. is going to be what does the Iron Curtain look like? Mm -hmm. Because we, we know that at this point, Stalin has probably already decided, okay, you know, these Western leaders are really are not in my camp. He's probably mm -hmm. already decided on the Hermit Kingdom thing. Um, mm -hmm. But he hasn't necessarily occupied all of these former German holdings in Eastern Europe yet. And, you know, if the, when the war drags on a little bit longer like it actually did, gives you a good chance to occupy all of these countries and then just kind of say after the fact, like, well, you know, this is the USSR now. These are satellite states. But when they haven't been occupied yet, you, is, are the allies going to put up a fight over this? Are they, are they always going to say, hey, you know, Stalin, you really just can't just roll in here and set up a puppet state? I, I feel like the, the, East, the Iron Curtain may get pushed a little bit east, but I, honestly, I, I think that... Churchill is going to probably see this as a huge coup. Like, mm -hmm. yes, like now, like we can really assure like the Soviets don't get Eastern Europe. But honestly, 
I feel like FDR is going to give most of Eastern Europe to the Russians. I agree. Still, because mm. I, I, I think even by November of 44, there was sort of an implicit agreement between the Western and Eastern allies that Eastern Europe was going to be more of a Soviet sphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if the Soviets didn't occupy all that much territory in this scenario, they've mm -hmm. lost catastrophic numbers of people, millions and millions. Yeah, they, they want blood. Yeah. yeah. yeah, And they're going to get their, their pound of flesh. So honestly, the Iron Curtain is probably going to break down similar to what we see um, but you may see more resistance in some of these countries because, you know, the Soviet troops, you know, didn't conquer it by force. So maybe the people are a little bit more aggressive in sort of their opposition. But ultimately, or maybe something like, you know, they didn't get a chance to wipe out the Polish resistance. in yeah. One fell swoop. Well, yeah, well, the yeah, the, well, the Warsaw Rising had been put down by November 44. Oh, I see. OK. But um, but remember, there'd be a whole chunk of Western Poland that was still under German control. Mm hmm. In a situation like this where Germany surrenders under those circumstances, what about, like, the Holocaust? Like, do people even know about it now? Oh, of course. Oh, well, remember, yeah. by well, November 44... They had liberated is, yeah. the Western camps. No, right? they hadn't. Auschwitz wasn't liberated until January 45. Bergen-Belsen and Dachau and stuff like that weren't liberated until you know, April 45. But it's, I mean, if, so, if they're going to occupy Germany, this is inevitable. Oh, they'll be known about. And I'm yeah. sure that there will be war, there will be some sort of war crimes trials. Um, and because there were, in reality, you know, people talk about the Nuremberg trials. And yes, those are the big, the big, you know, head people. But there were tons of smaller, sat, I want to say almost like satellite trials that came off, like the the guy, the commandant of Auschwitz, Bergen, Belsen, Dachau, they were all tried in these like mini trials that included their a lot of their guards and a lot of them were actually executed the poles executed basically like the entire like the entire like you know staff at, at auschwitz like the highest ranking staff were all tried by the poles and executed in 47 i believe mm -hmm. like but they i i figured that that was still gonna that's still gonna happen because obviously it the only unfortunate thing within a surrender like this is it may give Nazis, those who are left, those who aren't in Berlin, more time to try and escape, you know, get to Switzerland or Sweden or, you know, okay, but wherever. Okay, here, but here's a question. Yeah. Okay. At the Nuremberg trials, when the Nazis, as part of their defense, you know, they alleged that the Allies had committed war crimes, firebombings of Dresden and Kloon and other, other Remember, cities. Remember, firebombings in Dresden won't have happened. Oh, that's but right. But still yeah. firebombings well, okay. of other cities. No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, but, yeah. but this yeah. is still pertinent to yeah, my yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they going to have a stronger claim if they say, okay, well, you dropped a nuclear bomb in the middle of Berlin, which is our most populous city at the time. Uh, how many people are in Berlin at this point? Maybe a million? At least a million. Maybe more than that. Yeah. So you have no, you can't really say, oh, well, this is, you know, a military target. Uh, are they going to have a stronger claim when this war crimes trial finally hits. No, because they lost. <laughs> That's true. So they're yeah, I mean, so they, no yeah history what. is always <laughs> written by the winners, of course. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that the, I, I that may have but been. But for posterity. I, uh -huh. I, I, you know, to be perfectly frank, like that, that may have been raised by, because remember the Nuremberg trials happened in November of 45 in reality. So I'm pretty sure that the Germans may have brought that up, their defense lawyers. But I'm at sure this they point, would to be perfectly frank, I don't think that point's going to, they're going to well, say, well, sure. we had to do it to stop you guys. Right. right. I mean, it, it won't, outweigh, that, it won't it outweigh the Holocaust, of course. Yeah. So, But they'll say, you know, look what, look at this atrocity, you know, mm -hmm. had, you know, not only did you kill hundreds of mm -hmm. thousands of noncombatants, but. Um, you destroyed these centers of cultural pride. Well, there's that. The you destroyed the Reichstag, yeah. which is our, you know, literally our governing well, we're, institution. We're, we're, I guess we're assuming the bombs being dropped in central Berlin, oh, sort yeah. of in the the, dis the area near the Reichstag, near where Hitler's bunker was, and all that. So. Right, because they'll try and kill every politician that they could possibly kill. Yeah, and I would yeah, imagine going for the sort of decapitation strike. Um, and that, I mean, that would be unprecedented. I don't know, you know, in one single bomb has ever destroyed the entire political leadership of a country. Well, I don't know if it would have, but it would have killed a lot. I mean, think about this. What if Hitler is in his bunker and he survives? I mean, lots of people... He'll probably be trapped. Well, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. He it might would be have... like that episode of Twilight Zone where the dude comes out of the bank safe and <laughs> his glasses fall off. Maybe we see Hitler <laughs> at trial with like radiation poisoning, hair falling oh, out. Oh, God. Yeah, just like then... ulcers all over his face. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds a, good to me. Yeah, he gets a sympathetic... Uh, <laughs> You know, a sympathetic acquittal or something? Uh, no, no, that, that was going <laughs> to no. Although it's, it raises the interesting question, not only of what he, okay, so, you know, that, that, that actually, the issue of, you know, Hitler being on trial, I think is sort of beyond the scope of this episode, but it right. actually raises a fascinating question of, was it better that Hitler, you know, was dead before the allies got the chance to execute him because, mm -hmm. would that have provided sort of a, a stand for him to sort of, 
martyred each, sort of martyred yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I, but dropping a bomb like this and destroying most of the nazi leadership i think you'd also see claims that these people really didn't die which there were a lot of those claims like that you know that true. you know martin that's bormann totally true, who was right. hitler's secretary for years people swore that he'd escaped to um to south america and it was confirmed in the 90s that i actually did die trying to escape from berlin but you can imagine a scenario where a lot of people are like well maybe someone did make it out is you know you know, if these people are vaporized, if Hitler's nothing more than carbon ash, you know, <laughs> no one's going to be able to confirm that, you know, are That's people right, going to yeah. be arguing, are, is there, you know, the danger of, you know, you know, Nazis saying, no, well, these people really didn't die, you know, they really oh, escaped this, or whatever. Yeah, like a neo-Nazi revival. These, yeah. These yeah, ghosts like, of the Nazi high command yeah, haunting like, Germany like forever. Jesus's body not being in the tomb. Yeah, I see. <laughs> I don't know if we'd uh, make that exact in, in like the most well, they, I'm sure way. I'm sure the neo-Nazis would have blown it up to that, no. you know. Yeah, to, no. Oh, Hitler's body wasn't in the bunker, you know. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it's like Ezekiel, he's ascended. Yeah, he's going to come back. Oh, right, yeah. exactly. It's, maybe Adolf Hitler insists, like survives and still insists on ruling the country as he's just, just <laughs> mangled, yeah. just falling he's apart. Like losing all of his hair. But also, I think that it, it raises really interesting questions of, an, an earlier use and it really will cut short the war in europe for sure i figure but J the pacific different question but i think we're seeing well, if it gets used early in in the war you know in europe uh, how gun shy are we going to be about dropping them on japan probably not gun -shy. probably not gun shy well, i don't know though because we're talking about dropping a atomic bomb on an area that is highly visible to the western world unlike japan you know right. like, hey, people think about berlin a lot people yeah. live near berlin berlin is a constant it was, reminder it's a major them. european city yeah like maybe mm -hmm. this is more of a potent like uh, uh oh so you, there's more opprobrium as a, yeah, yeah yeah perhaps yeah it would really depend i wonder i mean how it would depend on how it would be covered in the western media yeah a lot, I'm sure. Well, I um, think you'd see back. I think people, would, obviously, as with any use of a weapon like that, there would obviously be backlash after the war and people saying, did we really need this? Would people have been arguing, could we have defeated Germany without the atom bomb? <laughs> oh, we would have done it super quick. The yes. Battle of the Bulls just would have. Well, no one would have. Right, yeah. they, they said, no, oh, no, no it would be like with Japan. People would be like, oh, we could have blockaded. It yeah. was surrendered. Well, right, it's, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it raises very, it raises interesting, you know, sort of that question, you know, maybe the war's over by early 45. Um, well, certainly in Europe, it's done by the end of 1944. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you're seeing a different Cold War, a different start to the Cold War, and maybe a start that's a little more advantageous to the West. Maybe that that lulls the West into a little bit more of a, you know, less accurate view of what's going on. I don't know. Maybe but it makes the East more aggressive. It makes Stalin run. more aggressive. Yeah, the idea that, like, we didn't actually conquer Berlin, that we just took the remains of it after the Allies had pulverized it. Because right. we talked about this a little bit. CJ, you mentioned the fact that now Russia has all this this industrial capacity. It's ready for war, and it doesn't get to do it. Oh right, yeah. And suddenly, well, there's all this fertile land off in the east that Japan occupies. That's... I, yeah, I mean, if you you gotta put yourself in the shoes of of Stalin, um, or just you know the Russian leadership, <clears throat> you've lost a lot of guys. Germany really took a lot out of you, and now there's there's a a certain degree of um, revenge. Uh, there's a certain degree of bloodletting that I think, you know, Russia's on the warpath. I think they're going to sit down and, and say, well, we just starved half of our population um, in order to, like, rush industrial production, in order to rush military industrial production so we could fight back against Germany. Now we're here. We've got all of these tanks. We've got all of this artillery and Berlin just gets exploded in one day and it's over. Well, that's a little bit anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. And we really, you know, we want some retribution. So maybe when the war shifts to the Pacific theater, we're looking at Russia slightly more eager. Maybe FDR doesn't have to beg them, <clears throat> oh, may, you know, invade Japan with us. Maybe they're a little more eager to uh, get into to Manchuria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're, well, oh, you know, you're Stalin. Well, Hitler's out of the picture, so... Japan's gotten even, you know, a slightly weaker military, and especially the fortifications in Manchuria, which I think we talked about in the um, atomic bomb episode, they just rolled right over on the day of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Well, they, they had been preparing for a while for this, but yes, you're, right. you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, but I mean, it, my point is that Japan just, if they're fighting the United States in the Pacific, and Russia invades with full force, they're not going to be able to... to put up a decent fight hmm. and Russia 
might just, yeah, I mean, they're on the warpath, like you said. Mm -hmm. So are we looking at, are they just going to bring it to a halt and say, okay, well, it's just let these, all these tanks and all, you know, all this artillery and all of this planes just sit around. We build them. Now we're just going to let them sit in the warehouse. Or is he going to go and try and conquer something? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's a really good question. So maybe a more aggressive involvement in, in East Asia and the post-war years on behalf of the Russians? And, and... Um, and I mean, here's another thing. You've got a bunch of all these weapons sitting around. With the common turn later, uh, you know, we know that Russia supplied weapons to communists, oh, yeah. uh, communist insurgents in Asia in all of these different uh, revolutions, all these different conflicts. So are we looking at more weapons being supplied, better stuff, you know, tanks? Because they've got all of it on layaway, so you know maybe we you know maybe our our guys in China need some you know some tanks. I don't know. And and speaking of post-war Soviet Russia, like regardless of how things turn out in the East, what you've done is you've done a fantastic commercial for nuclear weapons. Like you drop right. a single nuclear weapon on Berlin, and Nazi Germany crumbles completely, just dies. War's over. Right. So I mean, oh yeah, we're gonna have uh, this siege of Leningrad, and we're gonna have the siege of Stalingrad, where literally I think a million people died in that battle. Yeah, probably a million in both, at least if not more. Yeah. So yeah, it, so Russia's just weathered these horrible defensive campaigns, and just wave after wave of German onslaught. Uh, how many Russian troops died, Matt? Do you have a number? The conservative estimate is, I've seen the numbers up as high as 13 million okay. Russian soldiers on top of about 20 million Russian civilians. So we're talking unbelievable yeah, casualties. That's... On top of top Stalin's purges, the Holodmer, you know, all this yeah, the starvation. Yeah, you know, like Literally just, inconceivable amounts just, of casualties. Just unbelievable amounts of people dying. Plus in Eastern Europe, tremendous numbers of people died. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just all, all around just devastation. I, I think that... It'll be it'll be interesting to see also the Soviets trying to digest these gains that will make in Eastern Europe, but they didn't really conquer them. So right. they're just being. And so yeah. if, so yeah. if you're mm -hmm. Stalin, and you've just had to weather all of these things that we've just listed, you know, thirty three million. You've just seen thirty three million casualties you've had mm -hmm. to absorb, and then all of a sudden the Allies drop one bomb, mm -hmm. and the war is over in one day. Oh yeah. I think this is something that we're probably going to want to do. Oh, yeah. I think the Soviet <laughs> atomic weapons program is going to get kicked into high gear. Definitely. Um, all, yeah, they're going to absolutely try and develop them as quickly as possible. And it may also be assigned to other powers, too, other countries in the world. Um, that Yeah, you know, maybe like Japan you, says, hey, oh, well, yeah, they, we better, well, they <laughs> we better kickstart our program Japan, as well. Japan did have an atomic weapons program, but it didn't get anywhere mm -hmm. um, during World War II. But I'm talking about just in general in a post-war world, other countries are going to be like, wow, like look how powerful this weapon was. Like all the, the Americans needed was one. One that, bomb that literally defeated the Nazis defeats with one the Nazis, bomb. You know, like we need that too. And so that may set a dangerous trend. Um, that you know that i think that 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 people are like well we can just end the war with one bomb and mm -hmm. that's you know dangerous. it's, it's kind of military dangerous. panacea yeah which is how people saw it you know up until about the 50s like that was part of u.s like the u.s and Foreign soviet policy. strategy yeah. was that like the idea that like, we're just gonna use these bombs like you know people threaten us like we're just gonna it was really up actually the americans uh, between 45 and 49 when the soviets in reality tested their first bomb they're like well we'll just use this if anyone you know, if the Russians threaten us, like, boom, we got the atom bomb. They have nothing to retaliate with. And then once the other side gets the bomb, then the calculus changes. But right. it was... Uh, well, that just goes to show, I mean, that just goes to show how cavalier the attitudes were early yeah. on. Yeah. Um, we mentioned again, I, I don't want to go back too many times to the atomic bomb episode, but you mentioned how they were planning to just, uh, oh, well, the Japanese, the fortifications are probably going to be really strong on the beach. So we'll just drop nukes on their defensive fortifications. We'll yeah. just drop nukes on their troop formations, and yeah. it will be perfect. You know, it's just part of our inv uh, invasion strategy. Well, I don't know if you want your entire army running over freshly irradiated, exactly. <laughs> you know, cra craters, but that's yeah. fine. You know, yeah. so it'll be interesting um, with this. Uh, and depending, although we're talking about like the atom bomb bringing down Germany one day. Just a side note on that, like that doesn't depending on how many people in berlin if it doesn't destroy much of you know if hitler manages to survive or himmler manages to survive you maybe could see the war continuing on the allies may have to use another atomic weapon um it depends on we're just imagining do, well, this do, is I the mean, worst possible do we situation know if, for the, i mean hitler's bunker was definitely not 
well, built to withstand a nuclear bomb. Well, well yeah, remember but... up until up until about July or August, he'd spent a lot of his time at the Wolf Slayer, the Wolf Schanze mm -hmm. in East Prussia, and he didn't really. I mean, he was in the bunker in Berlin more. Well, you know, he's getting out of East, East Prussia at this point. Yeah, yeah, there, but not all of East Prussia was conquered. But obviously, the the connection had been cut by the Soviet advance. So, um, but really, I, you know, Hitler didn't really retreat into the bunker like for good until like about March or April forty five. But uh, he's still going to, I mean, I, uh, an atom bomb dropped in the center of Berlin is probably going to kill him as long as he's in the city. I mean, right. well, so. that's also assuming that we know where he is. Yeah. I mean, is mm -hmm. our spy infrastructure good enough to be able to tell the allies where every well, single with an atom bomb, you don't is. have to get within 100 feet. Oh, this is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just it's like horseshoes. It's <laughs> you just got to get, you get points for getting pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But, um, <laughs> so I'm sure that the United States and, uh, you know, joint USA British intelligence would have made serious efforts to ascertain the location of all of these guys, all of these high up Nazis before they dropped the bomb, whether or not they would have been successful. That's, this is all speculative. They, they might've been able to, to figure something out. Yeah. I, I'm sure that they would have, uh, an atom bomb dropped on Berlin is definitely going to severely damage the high command. I mean, when, and once you've got an atom bomb, let's say, okay, we've completed the atom bomb. Now we just have to wait for Hitler to be in Berlin. Yeah. Well, that's probably going to happen no. at some <laughs> some point pretty quickly. Right. And and like, here's a question, and I don't know if this is valid, but maybe they drop the atomic bomb, it kills the, the German high command, and some general takes over. Maybe that's better for Germany's fighting capability. I mean, they still have the army basically intact, and now you don't have these idiots spending all this money on wonder weapons. Wunderwaffe. No more <laughs> Wunderwaffe. Except what we're talking about is a... Wonder Weapon winning the war in one fell swoop. So I right. guess that kind of... Well, it's an American Wunderwaffe, though. Yeah, so it works. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. The so they actually... It wasn't just, like, some stupid, like, you know, like, tank that you would roll it's around It's a big in. tank. Yeah. It's, it's a, huge. The tank is big. <laughs> it's a land like, cruiser. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I know. Let's have these giant suicide bomb planes that drop tiny... Oh, God. <laughs> We're going to bomb New York. That's what's going to win the war. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. But at this point, the, the Allies are, you know, they're on the borders of Germany. Mm -hmm. And the German army, you could fight maybe a delaying action. But also remember, in this case, with the atom bomb program up and running, there's a bomb dropped in November of 44. What's going to stop the Allies from saying, oh, you don't want to surrender? Like Munich or Dresden or whatever is next. So they're right. just going to keep on dropping which bombs. Which is brutal. Until, it just gets which, exponentially well, worse. It's just going to it's just going to reach a point where once you've deployed that weapon, it's only a matter of time. Maybe the Germans will try and hold out. But I just don't see, I don't see, even if some sort of general takes command, the Guderian takes command and wants to continue on the war, like, that's... It's, yeah, it's going to have to be a the, real hard line yeah. general, too, because yeah. it's going to have to be a guy who's going to mm -hmm. sit down at his, you know, at his planning table and say, well, you know, Berlin was just turned to carbon ash, as Matt said earlier. Uh, the entire high command has been wiped out. The Russians are on the warpath in the east. They're bearing down on us. And then the Allied troops are in France right now, and they're bearing down on us. And it, well, they just actually br just broke into they broke Western in, they, Germany. They breached the Western Wall. You know? So it's going to have to be a real hardliner, somebody with a lot of balls, to, <laughs> to sit down and say, hey, I think, you know, let's fight to the death here. Uh, in the face of these, these are pretty bad odds. So I'll tell you what that hardliner is probably going to try to serve up to the West. They're probably going to say, let's make peace with you. We'll keep fighting Soviet Russia. I don't. I don't, think, I don't I, see them taking. I think though. the Americans and the British, because remember at this point the the relations aren't, you know, haven't degraded to the point where I think they're going to say no. You're surrendering to everyone, hmm. like that. Especially when we're in a position of power like this, you're not going to be able to play like, oh well, we'll surrender to the Americans and the British, but like, not the Russians. Like I think they're going to say, <laughs> That's right, like, guys, you don't please get it. stop like, invading us. It's a, we're cool now. We're cool now. Yeah, no, it's a. Uh, yeah, I, Hitler's gone. You know, we're back on the same, pretty much on the same side now. The madness has passed. You know, oh, yeah, I, so, yeah. I see so clearly now. Oh. <laughs> right. No, yeah. This, so this likely is, story. This is going to be. I think this is going to say no. You're surrendering. Like German soldiers, put down your arms now. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the end. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, with with Churchill, I mean, FDR might might have been a little bit um, softer in disposition, but definitely with Churchill and Stalin, they're going to insist on occupation. Oh, no, no. The yeah. Americans are insisting. I think that's foregone conclusion that Germany yeah. will be occupied. It's just the question of what that occupation looks like may be very different. So there's no um, way they can say, you know, we're going to, you know, just surrender to America or just sur surrender to, to Britain because 
well, what's going to happen? You're going to keep fighting the Russians while the Americans have occupied, you know, no, half no, of no. your country. No, 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 no. I it's, don't know. No, it's pretty much done. Like it's a done deal. Like at that point in 44, November 44, you're going to be, there's going to be a surrender. Like it's, it's going to be, or it's to going to the brutal end, to the brutal end, which I'm sure that the Germans would not have had the, they're just at that point. I don't think the German populace would have tolerated a general saying, no, no, we're going to keep on fighting as your cities get enveloped by these huge mushroom clouds. You know, right. no, we're going to, we're going to fight to the end. Like, no, I think they're going to say, no, this, this is enough. Like, I, yeah, gonna... I think, I think losing Berlin like that with, with such a traumatic, um, you know, and again, this is the first time that anybody's ever used a nuke. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're talking about entire world full of people having to readjust their perceptual schema to accommodate this notion of a bomb that can just completely destroy a capital city. One of the most famous cities in the entire West yeah. just no, pretty much no longer exists. I think or that... Or is there be so severely damaged that the, the time that it would take to build it back up? Because Berlin yeah. is a big city. I mean, it wouldn't have been totally wiped out, but the core center of it probably would have sustained horrendous damage. I mean, mo most of the, a lot of the historic buildings, a lot of the, yeah. you know, cultural, as mm -hmm. Max pointed out earlier, a lot of the cultural stuff is destroyed. And that really does crush a population's will to fight. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since the Germans, um, a huge part of the the success and st stability, internal stability of the Nazi regime was the fact that they were able to keep the war away from the, the general German population for such a long time. The effects of the war didn't really hit them until Russia and the USA start, well, well, I mean, the USA the, started bomb, the fire bombing. bombing. Well, yeah, the Brits, right. the Brits and the Americans. In the early bombing. stages of the war is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, hell, the Germans didn't do a full mobilization like basically ever during the war, which is shocking. But, but speaking of this occupation, like I'm trying to imagine what it would actually be. I mean, are we seeing an East and West Germany just like in real life? It might be like occupation zones, but... It might not be like, oh, you know, the same just split it right in the middle. Hmm. Well, it wasn't split right in the middle. It was, I think the Allies are going to have more negotiating power with the atom bomb. Hmm. And they're like, remember you know, maybe, that. Maybe, maybe Soviet Russia just gets like a chunk. You know, they get like. A smaller chunk. You're going to like the East old, Prussia. E, the old Eastern Prussia area. Hey, yeah, yeah, have, yeah. Have, have, have Berlin. <laughs> hey, <laughs> take this it. is yeah, take the whole damn thing. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you're done with it. <laughs> Hey, you know, we, we, we cleared out all the old yeah. architecture so you can build your commie blocks. That's and right, your, your tenement housing everywhere. Your, your, your gigantic <laughs> stars and sickles everywhere. You know, you've, we've your, got the monument your, area built I, you out know, for you. Iron cast statues of communists. You really... <laughs> no, yeah, so they can just build. So Berlin will be nothing but monolithic. Yeah, it's like, buildings. you guys can't Berlin. We're finished with it. We already... <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's perfect for you to occupy it. just go it's just a yeah. radiated you come just like flat boring <laughs> irradiated places don't you we build the Reichstag it's just this brutalist just rectangle <laughs> yeah right yeah like suprematist do we want to talk about if all of the Nazis get obliterated like this is it possible that the po in post-war germany communists have a much better time most of the leader power? most of the leadership of communist east germany post-war is sitting in concentration camps in yeah, 1945 right, uh, right. so it's not much of a different scenario i mean like you know the two guys or from, i mean are people, well actually no walter ulbricht is is actually in moscow who's the immediate leader afterwards he's like at a german institute uh -huh. eric honecker who's a guy who eventually East Germany will collapse under. He is in a constant. He's spent eleven years in a concentration camp by nineteen forty-four. He did, yeah. It was thirty-three to forty-five in reality. So yeah, yeah. So, so well, I mean, does the political legacy look different? Does the political endgame look different? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's going to really change because the, the the Soviets had their designs for what they wanted to do, but um, I think that's about it. Um, thanks for listening, guys. I hope you found this interesting. We thought this was a very interesting topic. Also, if you would like to reach out to us, uh, you can reach us at talkernithistory at gmail.com. We love to hear from you. Just if you have any ideas about episodes or any comments or whatever, just uh, shoot us an email and we hope to hear from you soon. Uh, this is Matt signing off. This is Connor signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.